First World Order Radio, finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. We get on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Seen in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same that your thoughts transmit it. Proceed in others in time, order, importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetistics of sound through the air, same that your thoughts transmit it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intention straight out. All right, so I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient history school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works. You have an activated pipe in and we have produced this black chemical called melon. <laughs> all right, all right. We still waiting for the guard to come in. Um, Brother A. Rashid is, will be here tonight, so just hold on. Um, but um, let's build while, you know, he come into, um, onto the line. So when we talk about the Kaaba, uh, Kabbalah, what we're talking about really is the science of the Moors in which that they took that information from out of ancient Egypt or Kemet or Tamare um, from years of study as being the high priest of Anu. And from those particular teachings, they took it up into – um, I guess what you would refer to as now as Europe or Asia Minor, um, as it was prior to that. And um, when they took it up, um, libraries and libraries of information was found. Um, as a matter of fact, Christopher Columbus or Cristobal Colon, um, who was a spy for Queen Isabella and King Fernandez, and also for the Portuguese government, what they did was to send him out along with others in order to find out what happened to the Moors um, just giving up the last stronghold of Granada um, in Spain without a fight. What was going on with that? Well, of course, we hear the story of uh, 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, but they never tell you the reason why um, outside of that he was going to India in order to find spices and gold and gems and emeralds and everything else in which that is talking about minerals um, or resources. Uh, really, it was to spy on the Moorish Empire because they knew that we expanded it from more than just outside of those particular kingdoms into an actual empire in which that we was doing international trade, import and export around the world. So they wanted to see how advanced um, and how complex our system was because they wanted to know and learn how to do it themselves, and that was the end result. Um, as a matter of fact, if you get Black's Law Dictionary 4th edition, as we were saying um, last week on the show, you will read up in Admiralty as well as also Consula Court. And you find that Consula Courts was abolished by President um, Eisenhower in 1956. All right? Um, and it said it was the last court was Morocco, right here in the United States, um, which was abolished in 1956. However, 
um, if you get the definition of amorality in the um, fourth edition, it says that um, that the amorality courts took over from the consular courts um, after the fall of the last um, of the um, of the Western Empire. Now, like we said, is this um, we are living in the West? In the West, allegedly, this is the um, Western Empire. But the question is, when did it fall? You know, um, and obviously by that definition, you, we can say that they were not referring to this particular empire. Obviously, they'd be referring to the last empire, the empire that was here prior to them. But they never give any um, historical facts concerning that last empire. But at least not openly, in a sense, you know. Of course, we know that the Omecs, or known as the Shi people, all right, or the Xi'an people, um, were some of the last people um, who actually came from the interior of Mexico on up into the Mississippi Delta and spread it out throughout the south on up into the north region across the Great Lake area and on up into California and basically surrounded um, the United States um, towards the borders based on the fact that that's where the water supply was, all right? Um, in doing so, you will find information in the 1800s. Matter of fact, it's from the Nexus magazine. Um, Brother Hakeem H.Y. Bay spoke about this, in which he stated um, there was an article some years ago in the Nexus magazine. I suggest everybody go and get the magazine. It's spelled N-E-X-U-S, Nexus magazine. And in the magazine, they was talking about um, when the blacks ruled the South. Of course, you know, we watched the movie Roots, in which that's been inundated within our psyche since 1977. Um, the only thing blacks ruled from what we've seen, according to the movie, was was Kunta Kinte um, turning to Toby and them running after Toby and him trying to run and get away. That's the only running that we know about. You know, we didn't know that um, blacks ran the South, you know, during the Civil War and, um, you know, and during um, that time period. So there's a lot of things in which that we don't know about in history in which that's been revised in our school educational system. And for some reason, um, older folks, um, at least two, three generations back, did not get the same um, information. You know, um, it seems that great grandmother knew who she was, you know, she told you that she was Choctaw, Cherokee, um, or, you know, uh, Seminole, or et cetera. So we know that there's a lot of information which that we did not know. Now, when it comes to this Kaaba, um, Kabbalistic information, or the Kabbalah, in particular the Holy Kabbalah, you can get from A.E. Wakes, he specifically states that the Kabbalah was actually uh, formatted by the Moors, and that the information which that was left within the libraries throughout Europe is how the Kabbalah came to be through various um, so-called Jewish priests, you know, Levi and others, in which that uh, was able to take this information and parlay it and make it their own, you know. And um, so now we think that the Jews have a monopoly on this information, when really it's metaphysics, you know, um, you know, in book form, coded. All right? And so that's what we're um, going to be talking about tonight. And um, we get getting ready to bring Brother A. Rashid on right now. Brother Rashid, you here. Peace, Lord. Peace, God. Man, God's work is never done. No doubt. So while I'm on the phone with you, I am approaching a uh, more quiet place. All right. Uh, so, you know, it's the streets in L.A. is off the chain. They're going in every day. <laughs> but, uh, so, peace to you and your family and the listening audience. I hear you talking about, uh, no question, I you talking about A.E. Wayne. So, uh, I definitely, when I talk about Kabbalah, I always got to, uh, make distinctions for people, you know, I got to make clear, clear distinctions for them so that they can understand that when you're talking about Kabbalah, you're talking about 
What it, it, the question is? What aspect of it are you talking about? You know, because there's a uh, there's a living tradition that involves uh, Western magic, and the Western magical tradition. When people say Western magic, what are they talking about? The Western magical tradition is the one that involves a far more uh, comprehensive uh, indulgence in Western psychology. When I say Western psychology, it's, you know, the thought processes that created how the West was won. You know, how the West was won. So it was won with uh, rhetorical arguments and a skillful use of sound and the form of word play and creating what you want to call or what I want to say is creating what you want to call uh, uh, synonymous symbolic referencing to extend the meaning of particular concepts. So to understand a concept in multiple layers, one must have multiple connections to it. So when you look at the school of thought that A.E. Wade comes from, comes from hermetic traditions that indulge themselves in Kabbalistic study. But <clears throat> they far more rooted in what is commonly considered what I want to call hermeticism, you know. That's actually what they were dealing with. Now, Kabbalah is a process. So as a process, it's something that is predetermined on a set of rules and factors. And these rules encompass a series of uh uh, 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 us being able to tap into specific what I want to say and what I want to call uh, symbol literacy uh, 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 um, symbol literacy uh, 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 factors like factors in the same way that numbers have factors and numbers are a factor hello hello we hear God. Okay. In the same way that numbers are a factor. So now, uh, numbers are factors, and the root word of factor is that each number is a fact, meaning that it is a predetermined reality that has its own truth. Now, words are always subject to interpretation based off of the psychology of the people using the word, but numbers and the numbers associated with these words transcend uh, human intelligence. So now when we take all of that, what I just said in consideration, it's very interesting when we take also into consideration the fact that the Kabbalah is uh, essentially um, a child of biblical contemplation. So it, it, the Kabbalists are those who contemplate the stories of the Bible and in their contemplation, render their own interpretation. So you would think that this would be a huge subject area that black people would indulge themselves in. However, I have unfortunately been um, been fighting a, a journey for quite so long. I've been on a journey for quite so long to introduce black people or people of color to the uh the modalities, content, and experience of what Kabbalistic co co contemplation is about. However, there is a blockage, and the blockage is, is an historical one. They are uh, angered by history. Many of them are just coming into contact with this information that we've been, um, that I have in, in a short course of about six, seven years, um, been imparting, and People just haven't got caught up to the ability to sit down and contemplate anything spiritual, you know, long enough to actually appreciate it and then allow that to transform their psychology. So, you know, uh, uh, Kabbalistic dynamics are the under 
current of the the language constructs exploited and utilized to advance civilization by all ancient peoples. They didn't have to call what they were doing Kabbalah though. They weren't caught up in having to define a particular modality of mind by a a a, a, a racial um, a parameter. You know what I mean? So you know. How did Kabbalah get to the world at large, how we have it now? Well, it's, it's generally, it's a Moroccan import based off of what the Moors imported into the realm of, of Europe via the, uh, the 7-Eleven endeavor. So during that period, before we got there, first of all, I want to say this. Before we even got there and ventured ourselves on the shores, we had uh, we had entered a land of persecuted people, and the persecuted people were people called in history called the Goths, and these people were were, were uh, excuse me, the Goths were the ones who were uh, who were the tyrants, and there was a Jewish population there. Now they never completely described the racial construct of these Jews. And when we say Spain, a lot of people are under the impression that we're talking about white people. And if you if you only know, if you look at a map and you see how far Spain is from Africa, and you learn about geography, you learn about the human experience that people have always traveled, you know, people have always take, took in journeys. Why do people think that we were uh, simply isolated in one part of the world but yet we pontificate all of these great um, spiritual and economic achievements. So it's very naive to just think that we were in one place. So I'm saying all this to say that the people, when uh, when brothers and sisters arrived, the people that they found there could very well have been people of African descent. Now, if they were not of African descent, this is one important factor to take into consideration, the fact that they had a... African dynamic undergirding their spiritual practice and their ability to um, to impart truth. So now, what happened in 7-Eleven is that now that there was a, a new rulership, Islam allows people to explore their um, their unique spiritual approaches to reality. And along with their ability to explore it, it allows the cultivation of science and various other uh, spiritual and political endeavors to come to fruition in their community. So Islam uh, brought to the, to, the, uh, to the world at large, it brought the environment to actually appreciate the sciences. And the science was imparted through linguistics. A lot of us want to um, to neglect the use of language or don't even adhere to the clauses in the English language, and yet we want to speak about foreign languages and getting back to my language. I want to get back to my language. You know, you always hear people say, they took my language from me. I want to speak my own language. Well, you are speaking your own language. Uh, English is a derivative of of ancient forms of word usage and it still has operative linguistic principles and powers inherent in them but these powers are not um they're not made available to people who don't indulge themselves in um in how the West was won and how Kabbalistic parlance how the concept of the astral realm became the content for the whole dialogue of creating an environment of commerce to give you a dollar bill that has, for all intent and purpose, a Kabbalistic, uh, it has a Kabbalistic talisman on it. And that Kabbalistic talisman encompasses the, uh, uh, not only does do they incorporate commission principles with the eagle as Heru, but they also place him in such a fashion where he is now utilized as the conduit by which to transform through the ego the energies of war 
and bring them down into the realm of physicality. As you can see, whenever you see the the bird or the eagle or the Haru image on the dollar bill, as it is looking towards the the uh, the the, uh, the ribbon that says E pluribus, E pluribus is a Kabbalistic code, one by which is utilized to encrypt a numeric valence, one uh, that that's equivalent to the number one twenty three. So now one twenty three equals a very significant number and word, which means the word war. So now, you know, I I, I really <clears throat> I really indulge this type of conversation to people who indulge themselves in the actual study and if you need the details on what it is that I'm trying to impart, the uh the details are fully loaded in inside of my books. So I encourage people to right. well, um to buy my books and right, to Brother Rashid. Themselves. Yeah. Um, um, name the titles of your books for the people can um get them and um the prices and everything. Okay, I have um the one that that I have uh as of most recently the most readily available one is the Kabbalistic and Metaphysical Interpretation of the Square Compass and Letter G. It's uh it's a book I composed to to dispel a lot of the myths and the lies made by ignorant people and those who listen to ignorant people um, in regards to Freemasonry. Uh, Freemasonry is one of the most, you know, important. It's the fourth major world religion in existence. And it has a, a great many truths enlarged inside of its rhetoric that can uh, unlock for the psychology of, the populace here a a means and ability by which they can actually um, uh, they can advance themselves you know psychologically and free themselves from a great degree of or a great deal of all of the uh, the pain that, that that has been placed on them based off of the um, the superimposed ignorance but uh, that book is awesome I also have the Kabbalistic and Metaphysic War in Iraq where um, which is a hit. You know, it, it, it sets forth um, taking people beyond just sitting there and giving them the conspiracy is showing them how the conspiracy is operating. Do you know what I mean? There is no one. Doubt. You know, and um, that's what we got. And I also got the Kabbalistic and Metaphysic interpretation of the of Hurricane Katrina, which is a um, which is a certified classic. And a uh, very timely message regarding the sorcery that was implemented during that catastrophic, catastrophic event that displaced many of uh, many women and children in Louisiana to um, to to open the way and create a uh, a new sense of whatever they're trying to do in that region of of the uh, of the Americas. At any rate, um, I do have the Kabbalistic and Metaphysics Square Compass and Letter G available for your listening audience or whoever, you know, if people download the show in the future. I have it available in ebook form, and if they, and uh, my email is kabbalagod at gmail.com. It's Q A B A L A G O D at uh, gmail.com. Q A B A L A G O D at gmail dot com. Right, give us your website. Uh the website is aarashid.com. dot com. All right now Rashid dot com. All right. Now um can you give for us um some books from which that they might want to um get or study? Besides for your books, for example, like um the Kabbalistic Encyclopedia by um, David Godwin or uh, some other books, you know, in which that would help them understand um, the Kabbalah and the teachings, you know, of who quantify um, the numbers with, you know, the letters, you know, coming yeah. from the ah. Hebrew, because we know that the same science is within Arabic also. So, You're right. you know, so, um, you know, you know, help the out where they can um, begin to 
like you said, they they lagging behind as far as um with these sciences, so we gotta catch them up. Huh? Yeah, seriously. Um, the 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 Google scholarship thing is over with. I mean, you know, I know you know, you you from the era of book reading, you know what I mean. But the new thing is people are enthused by this uh, this whole internet craze where you can you can just Google anything and then get on the internet and sound like you it's smart. You know what I'm saying? Right. And you know, I mean that's cool. You know, it gets you the jollies for a minute, but it doesn't tie you into the real uh conduit where the where the power lies in in the scholarship. It's just power and scholarship, and the power lies in you getting deeper. So books, I, I, I generally tell people to get. I don't I always tell people to get Godwin's first because I had plenty of people went and got Godwin's, and then I told them what to do with it, and they never did what I told them what to do with it, and, I, and that's because they're really not readers. I told them to read the introduction of the book. You know, books have introductions and prefaces. Why are you calling me, asking me how to use the book? Oh, it's because you never read the intro. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, and then the intro clearly gives you, it, I mean, people people wouldn't even need me at all if they read. You understand? If they read, you know. Uh, you know, at, at one point, you do need um, uh, uh, a reinforcing hand in what, what it is that we're talking about to get people to respect it and to have a sense of confidence as they indulge in this science and, and the study of what we speak of. But at the end of the day, it don't mean nothing unless you read. you got to read, you know. you got to read, the, especially that book in particular, read the introduction, and the book opens itself up. Another great book, and I, I, I say that it's great, and I really mean it, is by uh, Dion Fortune, Mr. Kukabala. That is one of the, uh, in my opinion, that's one of the best books ever composed on the subject of metaphysics or spirituality, period. The author, uh, Violet Firth, a.k.a. Um, Dion Fortune, was a uh, Golden Dawn initiate and also a master in her own right. And her claim to fame is her refined overview of the dynamics regarding psychic self-defense. And many of us are um, plagued by attacks psychically. You know, so many people are plagued by insecurities because people around them have not taken, especially parents in that, in, in, in that, in that respect, have not trained um, children in how to uh, defend themselves emotionally in a world that don't, you know, that don't care about them. So you, you find adults that are always talking about something, somebody's doing something to them, or they're tired of this, and they're tired of that, they're tired of being pushed around and all this. It's because they don't have the, um, the, the spiritual and or psychological equipment to deal with um, the subject of self-esteem. So how do you get there? You got to get there through a, a coherent understanding of spiritual factors and spiritual principles. Self-esteem is a psychological conceptualization, conducive to magic and making your abundance real. If you don't have self-esteem, none of your magic works. And this is why a lot of people are, um, <clears throat> are so distraught. They go and looking for elixirs and looking for somebody to fix everything for them and read them and tell them stuff about themselves. You know, it's interesting what's going on, but I'm not tripping. It It is what it is. They couldn't have a circus if they didn't have no suckers, you know? That's what Bonner and Bailey say. That's you know? the truth of the matter. Yeah. Yeah, well, what it is is that, you know, people um, like surface information. And they, like you said, they get the, um, you know, the kudos for the surface information. But when you get deep into this metaphysics, you know, um, ain't nothing can be said, you know, and then, you know, where's the audience? You know, oh, well, man, that's too deep. Or, you know, you went over my head. Um, went over your head because you're not reading. <laughs> you're right. not studying. 
You know, like you right. said, we from the eras of when we had to read. You know, right. so, so getting on, you know, getting on YouTube and listening to a nigga, you know, clip for ten minutes ain't gonna cut it. <laughs> right. 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 It's not. It's not. So um, the the other aspect I want people to understand, as far as Kabbalah is concerned, is this as well: that when you hear names like uh, Alistair Crowley and names like that, that's not Kabbalah. That's not Kabbalah in a traditional sense. It can be considered call it can come into the realm of it because it's an indulgence of certain biblical principles. However, at the end of the day that's not what it is. And um you go to any of the ultimate writers on the subject, like one of the world's most renowned masters on the subject mentioned Crowley on one piece of paper. In, in some of his books Where he could speak about it With such erudition And so much clarity He didn't even need to mention Crowley's name you hear? But once, just to say that The shit that he's doing is just Not real you hear? And that author's name is Gershom Sholo And he's the one who uh, Kind of led the way to Making Kabbalah scholarly Undertaking and exposing The spiritual role a spiritual role that um that Morse play, you know, in 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 the uh, magical traditions um that the world has at this point. You know, it was always in the beginning it was a writing, it was a tradition um based on writing. You had a significant writer in Spain at the time, he was the equivalent of nobility. He was even called a prince among his own peers at the time. His name is Ibn Barun, and Ibn Barun, Ibrahim, it, 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 they call him a Spanish Jew. It was Abu Ibrahim Ishak Ibn Barun, and they say at the end of the 11th century, he produced his work entitled The uh, Book of Comparison Between the Hebrew and the Arabic Languages. Now, let me tell you something. At the end of the 11th century, that's the 1200s, that means that we were still, we had already been in Spain 400 years already. Now, how is it that a Jew has an Arabic name, Abu Ibrahim Ishak Ibn Baru? It's because it's, the, uh, it's a Moorish paradigm there, and this is uh, um, the fact that he's able to cross-reference language comes from the fact that he obviously had the keystone of African con- consciousness involved in his psychology, you know, the Timbuk2 movement is a spiritual movement based in rooting in scholarship. You know what I'm saying? The people who composed the Quran were metaphysicians of the highest order. You know, metaphysicians who could, uh, hello? Oh, yeah, we here, God. Okay. Metaphysicians who could, who could uh, bend time and space with all, all of their various, you know, abilities, you know? And see, that's real... That's the real science because that's what I was saying um, in the little quote that I wrote today on Facebook and that um, that right. basically the highest level, you know, constant that we want to be able to get to is being able to dissolve the physical body and transform into, um, you know, what we call the ethereal all light being. You know what I'm saying? And that there's been many ancient masters who have been able to actually accomplish this feat, you know, and it comes through the signs of the holy breath. You know what I'm saying? And you know, really, when we get down to these particular books, you know, holy inspired books or teachings, it always comes back to the cycle of the science of breath. And um, I know, like, well, um, in the Bible, the, yeah. in the Bible, the symbol of the breath is the, the female Rachel. Right. Whenever you hear that that term, Rachel is speaking about the ruach. Ruach. That's right. Yeah, they always have that character in, in movies. And either once in the either she has red hair or throughout the movie she's gonna wear the color red, and right. that's just that's just a um, you know if they run the industry they put the symbols as they perceive them within the psychology of the people watching, it. and that's one of the uh, most pervasive symbols because uh, the breath is once it, it, the breath of course falls and brings us into the realm of form, but it also is the conduit which acts as an anchor 
that unifies the populace. So anything that unifies the people and is and has a um, a control over physicality like the breath does, it has a fem- female connotation. It is uh, it's like an emanation of God is in the breath form, you know. So the 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 uh, the languages that begin with the breath sound like Arabic and Hebrew, they start with Aleph in both languages that we start with, and it means ox, and we have that Aleph in the form of our letter A, which if we take the letter A and turn it upside down, it looks like an ox with two horns. So it's the same principle. So to stifle it, to put discipline on it, we put the letter Lamed, and the letter Lamed is actually derives, it means discipline, and it derives itself in symbolic connotations from the um the the flail uh held in the hand of of the uh of the pharaoh because you know the flail the flail was utilized uh excuse me the crook the flail was to beat the crook was to pull in so if you look at the crook it's like a it's like a spinning it looks like a like a um a, a, a pole with a curvature at the end, and over time that curvature became a ninety degree L, and the right. sound L is when you put the 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 tongue, the tip of the tongue, to yeah. the roof of one's mouth, and when right. you do that, you discipline the ox, and that's why they called it the ox goad. You know, they called it the ox goad. So as the ox goad, the um. As the ox go at the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the Aleph, the ah sound that bursts throughout the universe and is the conduit for all things to make themselves manifest, it becomes discipline and brought into the realm of matter. Now this is very significant. Now when we put L at the end of it and we discipline it, now we have the uh, the term synonymous with the surname for many. Um, Moors, which is a definitive article also in Spanish, is L or L. Or when somebody goes to, um, when they, somebody says the, is either day or L. So we, here we have ancient word usage because the, the sound day goes from, the D comes from the T sound. And the T sound synonymous with the place of something. So, you know, language, I encourage people to buy my DVDs, listen to, you know, you can go Google some stuff on YouTube, but you want to get right at me. You know what I'm saying? You can call me at 347-687-6765. You know, serious callers are always, um, serious callers are always uh, uh, accepted. You know what I mean? I, I truly appreciate that. But on on uh, you know because a lot of people call Aleem and they want to get the jollies they want to talk and that's cool but when you do what I do and what we do for the people professionally uh, much of our time and much of our work is 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 related to not sweaters it's it's about the betters you heard but once we you know once we get the people who really want the information out the way then perhaps we can uh, we could just chill. You know what I'm saying? But we ain't get there yet. I ain't chilling. <laughs> no doubt about it. And for those, you know, biblical, you know, readers, um, you know, uh, that rod and that staff that's mentioned within Psalms 23 is talking about the crook and the um, flare um, of right. the crooked, um, Kimite. So it's the exact same thing in which that um, Brother A. Rashid was just breaking down to you all for those that want to, um, you know, um, go and do more research on that. So do you got any callers? Maybe we could take some comments, questions, concerns. Yeah, we got some some um questions in the chat room. We got uh let's see here, we got a question. Um the question is is the Kabbalah an actual book like the Bible or no. is the word no. specifically? No, it's not a book. It's a it's a set of traditions that have that has been codified into various books. Right. So whoever asked the question 
if they were to start studying it on their own and wrote a book on it, their book is a Kabbalistic book. Yes. You understand? Yep. Like their book, their book is now a part of that living tradition, you know. But the, the thing, the rule of it is, uh, it's really, it's really. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna say this because some people have said the rule is that in order for it to be Kabbalistic, it has to be indulging itself in the contemplation of the uh, the biblical narrative. And has to have cross references back to the narrative, but one of the most significant books of Kabbalah, the Sefer Yetzirah, rarely if ever uses any biblical references. In fact, it's not even ancient book. I, you know, I, 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 uh, I'm not yet respected by the uh, the realm of Eurocentric scholarship to to. Posit this new reality, but I, I definitely want to start the conversation that the Sefer Yetzir is not an ancient book. It's actually a Moorish book for grammar and spiritual grammar. It's like spiritual grammar because it tells you where the potencies of various energies in the universe lie within yourself and external to you. And this was a contemplation that it, it, it was like it was like he, it was like an Arabic mind. Writing in Hebrew words is what the, the Sefer Yetzirah is. You know what I'm saying? No doubt. Like somebody that was familiar with, with, I mean, like tremendously familiar with the language nuances and, and, and everything involved in it, said, yo, let's write this book. And then it was, uh, because it's from that uh, uh, Islamic tradition, the Islamic tradition is always to remember things. So it's not about... You know, true scholarship is not about just um, sitting pontificating. It was also uh, uh, an endeavor by which people were uh, memorizing stuff. You know what I mean? Right. Memorizing stuff. So. Yeah, now, God, now, when we going to put our book together? Now, we've been talking about putting a book together shit, since 2005. <laughs> Man, you know how I go. Brothers be busy, but I'm ready, man. <laughs> no doubt, God. We're going to go to the phone lines. We got area code 321. Area code 321, you're on the line. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was there. I'm, I, I, how's everyone doing? How's everyone doing? Oh, we doing good, bro. Oh, okay. You got All a right. question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm interested in getting your book. What's your uh, email? Uh, you know. uh, my email is uh, Q-A-B-A-L-A-G-O-D Quincy Apple Beta Apple Larry Apple G as in God O as in Ostrich D as in David uh, Kabbalah God at gmail.com U A B A L A dot A L A. Right. Right. No, at Gmail. At Gmail. At Gmail. Yes, sir. All right. And uh, what what uh? Yeah, the, up, 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 definitely uh uh my uh ancestors definitely been pushing down for a minute. In fact, I I, I recently found a whole bunch of books, three books in the file. Which ones like were that. those? Uh, it was the uh, Zohar. I found the Zohar. I found. When uh, you say when you say when you say you found the Zohar, it's a lot of publications that say Zohar. The uh, the 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 uh, Kabbalah Center they provide a version, which is um, which is a Hebrew version. Uh, it's a translation from the original Aramaic into a more. Uh, a uh, a, a conventional Hebrew Then you have A translation that's being Created right now by a gentleman Named Daniel Matt For this woman named Margot Pritzer So this this uh, guy Daniel Matt Is a master of Kabbalah And uh, a, a very popular writer On the subject However his life is now been, He's been fortunate enough to make a living Simply by translating The Zohar which, which before that, he was um, con- he was writing a book about nothing, 
like literally, about what's called the Ein Sof in Kabbalah, the limitlessness or the concept of infinity, which is a spiritual principle, one that's highly, um, that comes into high spiritual focus in many spiritual traditions, in particular um, Indus Kush. They had a, a big, tremendous indulgence in the concept of zero or nothingness. But the Zohar is a book written by a brother named Moses de Leon in Spain, 13th century author. And uh, he uses what's called neologism, new uses of language. So they can't, it can't be ancient because there's words in there that's Spanish. That's, imagine me telling you something in African psychology, but I use Spanish words. I'm going to use words that were never used in the same way in Spanish language, but then I'm going to also include Arabic nuances as well as Hebrew grammar. So the book was just tremendously, just authentically new. So a lot of people are trying to tell you that the Zohar is ancient and it should be this rabbi named Bar Yochai or whatever, whatever, from the first century, and that's not the truth. Yes, but uh, I hope you. I hope I answered um, any of your comments, questions, concerns, and I hope I look forward to seeing you in the uh, email. If in fact you're serious about studying it. Oh yeah, definitely. I've been uh, serious for a minute because it's been pushed on me uh, to study it. I don't know why. It's just been pushed on me a lot by uh, every signs everywhere. So definitely. So if if you got. If so you gave your number out too, right? Yeah, three four seven six eight seven six seven six five is my phone number. So if you feel the call, feel free to call. Three four seven six eight seven six eight seven six seven six five. All right, definitely. All right, thank All you, right. brother. Thank you. All right, we yeah, got another caller here. Area code two one five. Area code two one five. Live on the air. Peace. How you feel, brother? Peace. This is Mo. I'm calling from Philly. Word. Philly in the house. What's good? Peace. Yeah, I seen you at um, Black and Nobel and you, when you did the phonetic fingerprints of the gods, and I swear it was one of the best lectures I've ever seen in my life. I got a couple questions on Kabbalah. Since, since that that uh, lecture, I've been studying, I've been getting books. But what's the difference between Jewish Kabbalah, uh, Hermetic Kabbalah, and Kabbalistic magic, and when I say magic, like I was reading books where they line up uh, the gods' names, archangels, angels, all the way down through the different cipheras. What's the difference well, between the three? It's historical and cultural differences. Uh, the Hermetic Kabbalah is the Kabbalah indulged in by the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. That's the group that. Crowley and um, his contemporaries, uh, A.E. Waite, uh, McGregor Mathers, Dion Fortune, all of them were a part of that. You can generally see that spelled with the Q because that's the one that synergizes with what they call Kabbalistic magic. You generally see all those books are cookie cut. They say the same things. They tell you to do a dispelling um, ritual and draw the pentagram in the air in front of you that showed you um, archangel names and stuff like that. Now, Kabbalah that's quote-unquote Jewish is one that's more predicated on the study of the biblical construct, the biblical context. You heard? So uh-huh. it's, a, it's an indulgence that spans essentially a far older a system of contemplation. Whenever they, um, and I don't want to say old and get spooky and ancient because the Bible and all that is not ancient. If you know a hundred people, if you know ten people that was a hundred years old, that's a thousand years. You heard? If one person uh-huh. knew somebody that was a um, hundred when they was ten, times that ten times, and that's like nine hundred years. So ten, we ten people away from a, a thousand years. You know what I'm saying? So we could keep a story together. Even if our meaning of the story changes, we could still keep the story together if we got the, the context there. So the Bible is one of those stories that has been maintained 
for the longest period of time, and now it just has different meanings to different people. So the Jewish Kabbalah is the one that deals with more of uh, permutation of numbers, contemplation of the alphabet. You have certain strings, like you had this guy named Ibrahim Abu Lafia. He's the one that uh, originates what's called ecstatic Kabbalah. His Kabbalah is a contemplation off of the ecstasy felt by the adherent when they jumble and mix together words in their mind. Like the word amen. We are familiar with amen when we hear it in our uh, indulgence on commission culture. We hear it at the end of the prayer in Islam. But what if we were to take the word amen and jumble it if we only had three consonants, aleph, mim, and nun? We would go Mim, mim, Aleph, Nun, then we could go Mim, Nun, Aleph, then we could go Aleph, Mim, Nun, then we could go Aleph, Nun, Mim, then we could go Mim, Aleph, Nun, then we could go Mim, Nun, Aleph. So we jumbled the words. We turned one word into several different meanings. So the ecstatic Kabbalah include, it was inclusive of you being able to jumble words in such a fashion where the jumbling of the words allowed now you the ability to have all of the associated meanings and devices of psychology required for you to understand fully. Now, that's one aspect of it. They have another aspect called zeros, which is kind of what I just described, but it's a little more complex, and it's one of the subsets of gematria. Gematria is taking grammar, and putting numbers to the grammar to pull numbers out of words. You understand? Mm hmm So now that's one aspect of it, and that's one aspect of Jewish Kabbalah, but that's one that the Hermeticists use. Now, when you start hearing about archangels and all that, the, 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 some of those archangels that they talk about, them, them, them joints ain't even in the Bible. You know what I mean? They're mm -hmm. not even in the Bible. They're not spoken about nowhere in the Bible. You heard? Nowhere with and they come from the 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 uh what are called um uh, kedushas or innovations of the writers and Kabbalistic compilers of the day. They'll create their own innovative um and contemplative means and methods of understanding particular concepts and and use as a rule, a biblical verse to back up what they're saying. So now, this is what got me into Kabbalah. I wanted to know what the word Nephilim meant. Yeah. So I found that I had I I I went indulging myself into what Nephilim meant. It didn't mean giant. That's a that's like a that's like a sick way to throw everybody off. Just make up a word that means something in one context of reality. And the shit don't have nothing to do with what it presents in the biblical narrative. And then you got all these people running around for giant bones. And anytime they see a giant bone or dinosaurs and shit, they say, those are the Nephilim. You heard? But the Nephilim don't have nothing to do with that. The Nephilim deal with breastfed babies. You heard? And it speaks about the um the aliens come from breastfed babies. So a baby that ain't breastfed is not transdimensional nor cosmic. You heard? You feel me? So that's yes. really the general context of the narrative because we're speaking about the part or the apparatus of the physical body that becomes enhanced as a result of that level of nurturing. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So so um uh Masonry is Kabbalah because why? Because it uses the biblical narrative to prove its spiritual point. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. they, they got a character that they just make up out of nowhere called Hiram Abyss. You heard? Hiram mm -hmm. Abyss is not in the Bible. Hiram, there's two Hirams in the Bible, but the Abyss is an innovation. It means father. But the word Hiram don't mean nothing but Kai is Kai is the root. You don't spell it H I R A M. That's anglicized spelling. It's ket it's ket yod resh mean. And chiram means uh elevated life or high life or higher existence or higher valence or higher frequency. 
It means the the self above the physical dynamic self. You heard? So now mm-hmm. when they kill now what happens when you kill the higher self? Where does it go? Does it ascend? No. The higher self when it dies it descends. It comes down. And then it becomes physical. And this is the secret of Freemasonry in the three ruffians. People always like to say Hiram is the black man. That's a cultural interpretation. You hear? But that has nothing to do with the spiritual interpretation. Hiram, the spiritual interpretation is exposed when they discuss how Hiram, in fact, was brought down into the physical world by way of death by three ruffians whose names are Jubala, Jubalo, Jubalum. The A, O, Um is what killed Hiram. So A, O, Um is Om. And whenever I own something, I vibrate it. And when I vibrate something, I make it visible. And when I vibrate it, I kill it. I'm bringing it down into the physical realm. So the 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 whole secret of the the word in Freemasonry is hidden within its ruffians, within the assassins. They're the ones who who are or encompass the secret word of Freemasonry. Because all the words past the three the three degrees are the words used by politics to prove if you're really a Mason. But they don't have nothing to do with the spiritual aspect because they give you fake words in the first three degrees. Them degrees is just to see, you know, they'll talk to you, but when you're getting in the red house and you're going up up, up the ladder, they're giving, you, they're giving you different words and they're telling you that your degree work and your blue lodge is fake. Okay. All right. Thank you, brother. Take care. All right. Appreciate you. Thank you. All right. We got some questions in the chat room. Let's go to them. One of the questions is, how do you feel about the contributions of Madame Bavasky, Andy Bassat, and Manly P. Hall? Uh, they all don't worthy, and I appreciate that. But I'm not tripping on race. And uh, uh, Manly P. Hall, in particular, is, uh, as a Masonic writer, is one of the only to give the most science without really no Masonic exposures. You heard a lot of his books are real good, uh, but he doesn't do any like great degree of exposures. Uh, Annie Bassant is awesome, and, and especially in the psychic modalities of thought, you know. And um, of course, uh, Blavatsky is a a uh, she walked with Krishna Morty, you know. She she was a traveled um, and initiated mind. You know what I'm saying? That that always presented throughout her life a an exceptional ability to understand a lot of spiritual concepts. So, you know, I don't get into all of the um the controversial, conspiratorial, uh, the white folks, you know, that shit is corny, you know. We have a hundred and forty year reading legacy here in the United States. I encourage people to read everything that they can get their hands on for books to become illegal which they already are in some capacities. No doubt about it. I agree. Um, let's get into some more of the sciences on um, about the teachings of the Kabbalah and basically how it's the physics and basically how it relates back to the physical body in, in um, a lot of the regards because that's the whole science is on how to transform this physical body into um in a mortal body or indestructible body. Um, what's your thoughts on that? What, what, what else have you found um, regarding that particular science, Bart? Well, it's all a mental science. So it just gives, uh, it makes, whenever you're dealing with something on a mental level, it creates a mental body for it. All thoughts are a body, you know? Thought becomes a body, you know? And the uh, the spiritual work on high Depends on what you, you know, it depends on the psycho- the psychology of your environment. Eastern philosophy focuses on a suppression of the ego to advance one and for someone to become more 
spiritually advanced, they ask you to suppress your ego. Now, if you suppress your ego in Western psychology, you you a sucker. You're going to be broke and stupid and naive. <laughs> you know, you can't have nothing. You can't have a car. You can't have a house. You just got to chill, be naked, and beg and ask people for money, for prayers and shit. You know, you'll pray for them. You know, you got to rub people's backs and give them uh, Reiki and shit like that. And just suppress everything for free. You know what I mean? Right. Right. But, but Western psychology, it, it, it's, it's, it's because we are in, especially if you're in the northeastern or the eastern part of the world, especially northeast, a lot of spiritual movements came up out the northeast because the environment, you got four extremes of, of weather. So the spiritual systems deal more so with rituals. And you acknowledging each of those four extremes, winter, summer, spring, fall. So gods that have four-letter names like Yahweh, uh, uh, once you got that, you can understand Indian cosmology. You can understand, um, you know, the, the psychological, spiritual sp- principles that underlie power. You know what I'm saying? Right. But people dealing with power. So, you know, you know, I, I advise people who live here get into your, um, get into your, get into your rituals, get into ritual and, and and spiritual systems that encompass dealing with ritual and giving your mind, start giving your mind some um, fabric to put on, you know. No doubt about it. Now, also, when we get into um, these particular sciences of rituals, do um, you have anything in which that you want to build on with that as far as, you know, like people, what you know, something, you know, basic, you know, simple in which that they can begin to start doing so that they can begin to start seeing it, like you said, building confidence well, you know, I, I, uh, when I it comes to science and magic. I, I generally don't, just, just, I don't, I'm not telling nobody that. You know, I'm not saying that on the radio because I'm not in the business of doing that for free. <laughs> I, I I want people to um I, I I plus I don't know these people listening, you know, and everybody conscious ain't our friend, and um people that don't have an invested interest in their spirituality ain't no good know how, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, it's a lot of people who've been sweating for years. They just been sitting up, ripping shit off line and. Taking little lines here and going buying five dollar DVDs from these bum ass bootleggers and shit, you know. And I'm not gonna tell them nothing that they're gonna potentially use, and and they have not invested their all into it. And then, um, and then you know the shit just just makes them more listless. It's like people that want to spend forty dollars on. Uh, they want to tell somebody to do their paperwork for them, but they don't want to get nobody um, what it what it costs. They want to get somebody twenty dollars, forty dollars to do a legal process that they know if they dumbass got locked up and them crackers put their ass in the quint, they, they mamas and them gonna be why why you didn't get a lawyer five ten thousand to get you out when here it is they can have a, a, a remedy for themselves that'll put it so they don't be in none of that you know so and and when you just disseminate and say certain spiritual contexts, like giving people rituals on the radio, you know, it, it undermines your spirituality as well. Because I know I'm not doing nothing for five hours. One, the Knicks play at the Garden, and I don't, I don't even do nothing for free. I do this. I did this for you because you my brother. I do this show and know the legs, but people don't be hearing me on shows like that. I don't have no time for free. You know what I'm saying, Lord? For real, you know uh, I mean? uh, every, everyone don't be offended, but um, that's the Scorpio, you know what I'm saying, and um, <laughs> that's just how it is. <laughs> yeah, the Scorpio moving into Saturn. I really can't play with that. I need my money. I need to put that's right because in cause that's the discipline teacher God, and um, that Saturn is gonna have to discipline. And, and wherever your money is at is what you're really about. You heard. Right. Wherever your money goes is what you're really about. If all your money goes to 
crack, you a dope fiend. You heard? You're not a scientist. You know what I'm saying? If all your money go to McDonald's, you a fast food addict. You heard? That's right. You know what I'm saying? That's, you know, so if, you're, if your money is spent on spirituality and consciousness content, then you're conscious. You know what I'm saying? So I encourage people to hit me up. You got the phone number. You got the email, Q-A-B-A-L-A-G-O-D. People that are on, um, I got a whole student. I got a student body that goes all the way out to 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 Europe. You know, I got I got people in South America, you know, that's on, you know what I'm saying? That's on, you know, I got people, you know, generally all over that's really serious about this information. You know what I mean? So Right. Um, we got another question in the chat room. Um, the question is, I thought that the three ruffians is also symbolic to the three false religions known as Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which hit us in our heads and which that robbed us of our knowledge of self and left us in an amnesic state. That's a that's a cultural that's a cultural interpretation. You know, because well, what what was it what was it before that? Uh, the three ruffians comes out of the um, of a set of documents that were um, that some of them are even pre slavery. So, you know, they got you know the, the Freemasonry comes from a set of of living documents that some of them still exist. So it's mystical and traditional. All of those 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 cultural interpretations uh, from the eighties and the late seventies with. Um, like the brother who did, what's his name, who did the Islam, Judea, Judaism, who was that? Was that Bilal Phillips? One of them brothers? Who was that wrote them books? Oh, oh you're know. talking about um, up under, uh, uh, you're talking about um, Mustafa Al-Amin. Was it him? Yeah, yeah who wrote just... um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam? No, uh, Judaism, what, uh-huh. the one who was talking about Freemasonry and all of that stuff. Yeah, that's was, it. Yeah. I yeah, think he was yeah. running with Rob Dean and them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, that stuff comes from that. I'm I'm talking about um, metaphysics. You know, metaphysics, it, it transcends culture. You know, culture is a limitation imposed by politics, and uh, and uh, and, and it's a it's a rep- it's a dialogue of repression. You know, where we constantly have to find meanings for stuff, like uh, a mystical tradition amongst oppressed people. It's for them to create uh, fanciful, mystical justifications for their imprisonment. You know, the Jews used to do it. The Jews did it by making themselves the chosen people who were denounced by the rest of the world and then their salvation is predicated on the coming of a Messiah, which is a whole conceptualization based off of the uh, deciding the, the, the and astrological use of Saturn in, in mythology, you know, you know, so again, that's just cultural. You know, it may serve the psychology of the the questioner and the the, the people around them, but I just offer a different. Because then you could go online and you can go listen to these shows where people just talk, or people who just talk to black people about cultural content. They have all of these cookie cut uh, equations, like is Israel means ISIS, Ra, and L. Which is, um, which culturally makes sense, but it's the farthest thing from the truth. You heard? It don't mean ISIS right now. Israel right. don't mean ISIS right now. That's something that serves the psycho like Solomon. People saying Solomon means soul, arm, and arm. No, it don't, because Solomon is the anglicized version of the word Sholima, which means that's biblical pie. So I'm, I'm, my, my. See that that's what has stopped me for so long, Ali. Oh, I understand, God, because I mean Israel. When I get into the science, people yeah. tell, bring me back to um cultural stuff. Culture. You know, they tell me that I have to address the cultural reality, and right. that's not where I'm going. You know, I did that. I, I'm a child of that. My mother was NGTGCC. You know, um, they was there when it first came out. The black man is God. The English sea lesson. My mother still have her English sea lessons from 1968, 1970. You heard? You know, that's right. old. You know, it's actually new, but black people have, again, 
only have been reading for 140 years. You heard? It's right. that. So everything is like new to us. You know? Everything, literally. It's embarrassing. No doubt about it. And for you all, um, in Hebrew, Israel means to ascend to God. You know, and it actually is a clear interpretation of the fact of the um, energy within you moving up the spinal column to the crown or to what we can refer to as the third or fourth eye in which that illuminates the mind to ascend to God, you know, um, is the symbolic transliteration of that, you know, from the Hebrew um, terminology, you know. And, so, and ancient psychology and far more ancient psychology Israel would actually be Asar L. It would right. be Asar's light. Right. It would be Asar's light, or you know, right. Asar's light, which is a which is a black light. Right. Right. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, y'all got to definitely go back and do this research because, like you said, you know, Israel, you know, Isis Ryan L. I mean, it does sound good. I mean, I've used it as far as culturally also. You know, but when we get down to it, when we get into the word and terminology, you know, you definitely have to take it back to the source. And like Brother A. Rashid just said, I mean, it goes back to all saw, you know, or all saw ray, you know, uh, which symbolizes, like he said, it, it's, it's the light of light, you know, or symbolic actually to the limitless light in which that goes back to the Ein, you know, principle, you know what I'm saying? Um, so, I mean, y'all got to go and do the research on that. All right, y'all, let me see if you got anybody else on the call. Area code 314, area code 314. Oh, uh, peace. Peace, Islam, peace. boy. Islam. Uh, Islam. 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 from St. Louis, Missouri Republic. Green, uh, yes, sir, I was listening to what you were talking about, the name Israel. Uh, there's also different variations of interpretations of the word. Uh, it depends upon who you want to believe. Uh, the same thing with Solomon. Uh, I believe it's three. Uh, well, not not I believe, but it's also variations of, of the interpretation of the word Sol. I'm on. Uh, so it be the Roman Latin word for sun. And on could be the Hindu word for sun or light. And on could be the uh, the comedic ancient comedic word uh, for sun or light. Because when you come into a dark room, you switch the light. The light does what? It comes on. So, so um, I, I usually I don't usually get into the uh, uh, what you can, what you call uh, debate over those because there's so many variations. Like you, uh, the brother Rashid said that you know uh, uh, it can be a culture interpretation of that. So. Uh, that said, so what do you have to say about that, brother? Um, generally, the same thing I said before. You know, the um, what what was it? What was it before the word Solomon even came out? Before Saul and Arm and On came out, you know, it, what was it then? So you know, culture demands from us different things at different points and periods. So it's really not, you know, you said you wasn't into debates, into debates, and neither am I. You know what I'm saying? This, you know, it's a good point. You know, when I when I was early in my development, I used to teach people. Uh, I used to use those as methods to impart certain truths to them, so they can delve and see further into it. But it's um, those are mystic Western mystical traditions linked to English. Again, the word Solomon comes from a. It's actually a number. Goes back to the biblical pie. The um, for those who who are under my student tutelage and who have indulged themselves in my class and know that I have already gone deep into the science of who Solomon is biblically and what that means spiritually, and that his name, Solomon, the name itself, is encoded all throughout the Book of Kings 1 and 2 within the edifices and the mathematics of the structures that they are speaking about. You can find the number 375, which is the equivalent of Solomon's name, encoded in much of the architecture 
which is a, which is a uh, ancient African practice of putting the leader's name. It's a tradition also indulged in in Mesopotamia, but as well as in Kim, to take the the the, the name of the ruler and encode it within the architecture of the building. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, okay. yeah, Solomon is um, Solomon is a very interesting concept. You know, very mm-hmm. interesting concept. But I just want my brothers and sisters and everybody who listens to what I have to impart to know. I don't want them walking in error, especially in light of the fact that there's so much um, information out there that can uh, bestow upon us a greater. Uh, method, greater modalities of actually understanding what it is that we say that we believe in, you know? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was also uh, listening to what you're saying about uh, the word Ibeth at the Hiram. Yes, and, uh, it was you said is not in the Bible. No, Ibeth, the concept, the word Hiram Abyss is not in the Bible, no. It's not in the Bible? No, the word Hiram Abyss is not in the Bible. No. Okay. Okay. I, I biff actually uh again, you know, we go we go through culture and metaphysics and uh symbolisms. Uh I biff you could say go back uh, I can go back to the Latin word I be meaning father. Well I biff it's, it's, go it's back older, to the word it's his older father. Word. It's all it's all the words like Abu in Arabic that means father. Okay. Uh, uh, it's not in the Bible. There's no such thing as a person named Hiram Abyss in the Bible. That was my point. You know. No. Oh, okay. Okay. But I'm saying no, uh, like that. No, you won't find it in the Bible. Uh, Hiram Abyss. No, you you would never find that. Okay. But uh, uh, the word you have to look for it. Uh, like, um, oh, I wish I had the Bible with me. I can kind of show you what I'm talking about. No, I'm I'm clear on what you're talking about. The word for but father, it, 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 it is in the Bible, though. Abiyah is in the Bible, but the, well, but it's, it's, it's not be, but it has nothing to, Yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with the Masonic personage. Hiram Abiff, that's in Masonry, is not in the Bible. They use a Hiram from from who is from the tribe of Naphtali in the Bible. Masonry puts the word Abiff on him. That's my point. Okay, brother. But I, like I say, I I beg to differ. But uh, there's nothing to differ. You actually you know, can't differ. I mean, it's I, like we I, I, a, you know, it's one of them conversations that these is one of the conversations I don't have. In particular, having with people that's not initiated in the Freemasonry. I am a Freemason. I wrote a book on the subject. So am I, sir? I well, I don't know what kind of degree work they're doing over there, and that's the that's the thing that I I, I, I witness. I bear witness all the time. It's a lot of Masons walking in error. I, I agree. You know, I agree with you. Most of them, the vast majority of them are. Right. You got some that believe there was an actual person named Hiram Abiff. Right. So, you know. But uh, uh, I'd like to get you. What, what, uh, what's, what's, what's your name again, so I can order your books? Uh, my name is A.A. Uh, A. A. Rashid. A.A. A. Rashid. Okay. And you and said something I, about uh, the Kabbalistic uh and metaphysics uh, the, square compass and letter G. Okay. And that's available in ebook form. And it's a uh it's a classic. It is okay. I got it when it first came out and um I can tell you I still have it. Eight years later. It's a classic. You would never uh want to put it down, you know, because it answers so many question about these particular sciences. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, like I said, I, I've uh, done a lot of studies in, uh, dealing with uh, Rosicrucianism and Masonry. And uh, the, guy uh, who made up, the guy who made up Rosicrucianism, Pascal Beverly Randolph. He, he, Pascal he Beverly said, Randolph? Okay. Yeah. I hip to one. He said that uh, Rosicrucianism is just was his one of his outer faces. They were they had a, a deeper science involved. When you read into much of the Rosicrucian literature, the um, from the European perspective, it's only really three three documents that 
um, substantiate Rosicrucian, Rosicrucian existence outside of Pascal's um, influence. And those documents uh, are what are what spiritually created the whole concept of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The same modality of a of a uh, of a of a woman, a damsel in distress, who needs to be mm-hmm. saved. The, the Rosicrucian documents are really talking about um, the, 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 the 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 paper ones that the white folks be drawing off of. is three of them, and they they uh, the ones that attribute to the authorship of Christian Rosencruz. Talk about a woman whose land was about to be stolen from the Moors. Uh-huh. That's from around, you know, that period when we started getting, um, you know, maligned in history. You know what I'm saying? All, all, all of our civic duties in society were now being taken from us, so they had to demonize us in all of the stories and whatnot. So, I mean, it's a lot of twisted turns. Rosicrucianism is good. It's an American thing, though. You know what right. I mean? And it's cool. It's cool. We use we should use those things to um to to make moves and build buildings and and stuff like that. That's really what that type of information is for to organize men around real things, you know. The the African American male is the most denuded entity on the planet cuz he can't get along with his uh with his um with 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 his counterpart and as well with his brother. Because they're always arguing Because they're really not initiated You know what I mean? Yes sir, exactly You know mm-hmm. uh, uh, yes, I look at it, all of it as uh, uh, A stem a stem off from, uh, from more science anyway That's, That's right. the way I look at it You know All of it comes from more science Comedic uh, more science teachings Right. All right, thank you, Brother L. You got a question here? Hold on. Area code 916, area code 916, you're on the line. Peace, peace, peace. peace. Uh, what's going on? Hey, Rashid, ooh, <laughs> big up. <laughs> what up, Lord? Okay. Oh man, everything's everything. This is how I call from Cali, man. Uh okay, uh good question for you. Uh okay, uh speaking on the uh Kabbalah and you know, the just the uh, alphabet alone, uh <clears throat> are you uh do you know anything about the missing ladder that they mentioned? A uh, missing ladder. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> it's um, uh, Okay, okay, it's just a, a book that I uh, picked up, and it has in it, you know, list the the uh, alphabet going through the twenty two, and then it's the twenty third one, which is oh. they mentioned it's a missing letter, and yeah, it's the sheen. It's supposed to come back when the Messiah arrives. Okay, that's a mystic, that's a that's a mystical tradition. It's right. twenty three letters, but. It really is 23 letters. It's just a different sound for the letter sheen. And 23, right. oh. is, 23 is a backwards variant of of 32, the number of teeth you have in your mouth, you know? Okay. So, I, I, I can barely hear you in that the background. But, uh, yeah, you you right on top of what I'm saying, though, uh, because uh, – the, uh, so you're saying it's one of the mother letters, then the sheen, because sheen's one of the mother letters, right? Right. And, and okay, so it's adjacent with the uh, uh, the Messiah coming back. So, what is that saying, though? Uh, is that saying that to look forth for the a woman to bring, you know, the sound, or you know, you know what I mean? Um, well, you you mix in two two concepts. The, the three the three mother letters are the letters that are attributed to elements for 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 to to manifest creation. So Aleph, Mim, and Sheen are the three mother letters that correspond to fire, water, and air. Now the uh, the Messiah is a construct psychologically inside of Judaism 
to substantiate the um it's called uh, it's called uh, okay, it's called I, paranesis. I, I, Hold on, brother. Oh, okay. It's called paranesis. Paranesis is the method employed by a particular philosophy, and the philosophy is promulgated by a priesthood. So their paranesis is created from a consideration of astrology and astronomy. So when you hear the concept of the Messiah or the Messiah coming, it's a stellar alignment. And we know when the stellar alignments come, we get enhancements in our spirituality or we, or, or what gets imposed on us are uh, limitations based on certain planetary bodies. Mm-hmm. So Saturn plays into the uh, psychology of Judaism because Saturn is, brings about limits. That's why on Saturday, Sabbath day, you have to rest. You can't work. You understand? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, that, that that's good. That's good. That covers it. It gives me a clear uh, understanding because, uh, <clears throat> let's see, because I'm just connecting basically the the uh, Hebrew alphabet with like the, because uh, you mentioned the astrology, the astronomy, with the days of the week, you see, and, and, and. Right. Things that apply with those letters, practice those during those days. And this, right. uh, are you okay? Okay. So, are there hours that line up with the um, the alphabet during the day? Do you know of? Yeah, that um, comes into the consideration of what's called the the Shimha Meforish. The Shimha Meforish speaks about the seventy-two deacons or the periods that are. That are um, experienced by the uh, stellar and solar, uh, as well as lunar imperatives throughout the day. There's 72 degrees. To each degree, there is a uh, an angelic force attributed to it. You can find them all in the book of uh, Exodus, when Moses split the Red Sea, and those 72 are the same 72 conspirators from. The the um, from Ken. All right, all right. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been looking for that that part right there too. Okay, good feeling. All right, I, I enjoy to see everything that you know you bring, mate. Uh, I, I, you know, I listen to you quite a lot, so uh, you're very informative and just big hey. us, mate. I, I appreciate it. Hey, where in yeah. Cali you at? I'm in Sac. I'm in Sac. Uh, you know, um. Um, I, I got a, a little show I do, a little thirty minute spot on Friday, and I, I brought on one of your uh, young brothers on there um, a few Fridays ago, uh, Ink, and uh, covered quite a few things and stuff. So, uh, you know, keeping things you know well tuned and trying to keep connect, you know, out that way. I know you in LA and stuff, so uh, yeah. you know, I got folks out that way, and doing some things too with the uh, with the kids. So. Yeah, uh, okay. You you put the information on you know on the show, so I'm gonna go on archives and I'll definitely link up with you stuff. So, no. hi right, Lord. Okay. All right. Thank you, brother. Uh, Appreciate you. Oh man, no doubt. All right, we got area code three two one. Area code three two one. You're on the line. Peace. All right. We got three minutes left. Anything you want to um, depart to us, brother? Um, A. Rashid, before we get up off of here? Uh, peace to the family. And um, uh, I just want everybody to keep learning. And, um, you know, don't be a sweater all your life. Be a better, you know? Yeah, right. You know, don't be no damn party. Buy a car. You know what I'm saying? No and doubt. What you spend your money on is where you're about. So... You know, ain't nothing free in the universe. No doubt, God. Appreciate you for coming on, and you know, of course, even even God pay rent. The rent He pay is called your life, right? Hmm. No up. doubt. Appreciate you, God, for coming on, man. I'm telling you, and um, you know, I, of time else that you want to come on and say some parting words, you know, 
um, definitely you can um, come on, God. You know, you know how it is. No question. No question. Appreciate you, though, Lord. All right. Same here, God. All right. Peace, Lord. All right. We- Peace, God. First World Order Radio, finally, finally, we are on the air. No doubt. All right, all right. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. Begin on into some of that order consciousness tonight. First World Order Radio every Wednesday, 8 p.m. We got to talk about what is taking place on the planet. There's always going to be somebody in the building on First World Order Radio. First, we need to let you know we're going to be doing more shows, giving out more information on Wednesdays. Wednesday is 8 o'clock. We are now going to make this is the hottest day of the week. Seen in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Earthly state of human concerns and existence. An indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. Burn. Seen in others in time, order, and importance. The most prominent parts, voices, or instruments. Burn. Earthly state of human concerns and existence, an indefinite multitude, quantity, or distance. Or System regulates to bring about specifics in the group based on value and natural characteristics. Current radiates electromagnetics of sound through the air, same as your thoughts transmits it. You need to understand how magical this, uh, something like this every Wednesday can become. So you need to start uh, getting your calendar right, get your schedule, your schedule right. You need to know our intentions straight out. All right, so, I mean, these clues are given throughout the various languages was to piece the puzzle of this ancient mystery school back together again. And what we plan on doing, both of us, is bringing y'all some surefire dynamite. We're going to take this level up a notch. We're going to have stuff to do here. This is not just going to be about philosophies and theories and shit that works. You have an activated pipe man in which I produced this black chemical called melanin. We, what we did was gave a hard line in the sand between the different definitions of esoteric studies and esoteric studies.